Hello, and thank you to Sages for inviting me to present our work. My name is Fareed Chima, and I'm a resident at Montefiore Medical Center in the Bronx. Today, I'll be presenting on our study titled Outcomes in Revisional Bariatric Surgery, a High-Volume Single Institution Experience. I have no disclosures. Secondary bariatric procedures are performed in up to 10 to 50% of patients who've previously undergone primary surgery. These include any revision or conversion. These surgeries are usually due to inadequate weight loss or weight regain. Failed bands due to complications or inadequate weight loss are often revised to other bariatric procedures, such as to sleeves or bypasses, with up to 71% of bands being revised at seven years. No large study to date has specifically evaluated altogether band conversion to sleeve or bypass, sleeve conversion to bypass, and revisions of only the bypass. The study aims to evaluate outcomes of these types of secondary bariatric procedures, specifically weight loss and cardiovascular risks. 266 patients undergoing secondary bariatric surgeries from 2009 to 2017 were retrospectively identified from a prospectively collected institutional database. Both one and two stage conversions from bands were included for analysis. Primary outcomes obtained were weight loss and improvement in comorbidities. Specifically, percentage of excess BMI loss, percent EBMIL, and percent of total weight loss, percent TWL, were included. These were used along with comorbidity definitions as established by the ASMBS. Suboptimal weight loss was defined as percent total weight loss, less than 20% at 12 months. Comorbidity definitions that were included were hemoglobin A1C, cardiovascular risk, and hypertension. Cardiovascular risk was calculated using total cholesterol and HDL levels. There was two year follow up. Figure one shows the breakdown of the procedures uh, that were performed. The most common secondary revision procedures performed were band to bypass conversions, followed by the revisions of the bypass, then sleeve to bypass conversions, and lastly, band to sleeve conversions. Baseline demographics were broken down by secondary procedure type as seen here in table one. The most common indications for revisional surgery were weight related, followed by dysphagia and then reflux, except in the sleeve to bypass patients who had reflux as the second highest indication for conversions. In looking at the band groups, uh, there were higher females in band to bypass conversions compared to band to sleeve conversions. On average across all procedures types, 55% completed the full two year follow up and showing up to every appointment there were 59 unplanned readmissions, with 24% occurring within 30 days postoperatively. There were four grade 3B complications within 30 days based on the clavian dindo classifications. Median length of stay was two days. Figures two and three show the changes in excess PMI loss and percent total weight loss over two years postoperatively. Looking at the band to bypass group in gray compared to the band to sleeve group in red, there was significantly greater excess BMI loss at 12 and 24 months and in the total weight loss at 24 months. Only the band to bypass had significantly continued improvement in these two parameters at 24 months compared to six months postoperatively. The rest of the procedures tapered off, as you can see here. This difference was also still seen when analyzing just those who had 100% follow-up. There was suboptimal weight loss in 31% of the band revision patients when grouped together, with no significant difference between the band to bypass and band to sleeve groups. There was suboptimal weight loss in 57% of patients in the sleeve to bypass group and in 63% of patients in the bypass revision group. In diabetic patients, there was no difference in hemoglobin A1C postoperatively between the two band conversion groups at 24 months as seen in figure four. Hemoglobin A1C did improve in diabetic band to bypass patients at six and 12 months, in band to sleeve patients at 12 months, and in sleeve to bypass patients at 12 and 24 months compared to baseline. This was not seen in the bypass revision group. There was significantly lower cardiovascular risk in band to bypass patients at 24 months compared to the band to sleeve patients as seen in figure five. Moreover, at 12 and 24 months postoperatively, dyslipidemic band to bypass patients had significant reduction in their cardiovascular risk compared to baseline. In the sleeve to bypass patients in blue, there was significant improvement in cardiovascular risk at 24 months compared to baseline. This difference was not seen in the bypass revision group. 
A summary of these hemoglobin A1C and cardiovascular risk changes can be seen here in Table 2. In terms of analyzing hypertension as an outcome, this was only analyzed in bypass revisions and in sleep to bypass patients due to data availability. In the bypass revisions, 40% were normal tensive at 24 months compared to 35% preoperatively. Similarly, 43% of sleeve to bypass patients were normal tensive at 24 months compared to 26% preoperatively, but this was not deemed significant in the analysis. There was no difference in blood pressures when comparing all bypass revisions and sleeve to bypass patients to those who had 100% follow up. So, in conclusion, this is a mostly descriptive study looking at outcomes of secondary bariatric procedures. As is common in the bariatric population, follow-up rate was low, with only 55% showing up to all postoperative visits. There was a surprisingly high number of patients with suboptimal weight loss. These two areas should be an area of concern and where systems improvements can be made to improve follow-up and weight loss. As one of the largest studies of its kind to date, in terms of the breadth of procedures and outcomes analyzed, it has highlighted an important issue in bariatric surgery. Band to bypass patients had effective loss of excess BMI and total weight loss at two years. The novel outcomes provided are regards to significantly improved diabetes and cardiovascular risks in sleeve to bypass patients, band to bypass, and band to sleeve patients. The bypass revision group in this study were suboptimal with regards to weight loss and comorbidity improvement. Based on the current data, bypass revisions of the GJ appear to only have a short-term effect, if any, on outcomes. Larger studies involving all aspects of techniques in bypass revisions will need to be looked at to draw definitive conclusions about the validity of the procedure. Though the increased risk associated with revisional bariatric surgery has been reported, this study <clears throat> supports the conclusion that these procedures can be completed successfully with a minimally invasive approach. There was two-year follow-up, allowing us to assess short and long-term weight-related outcomes following secondary bariatric surgery. Potential further avenues of investigation can be analyzing reflux improvement in sleeve to bypass patients and comparing outcomes to primary bariatric procedures. Here are my references. That's all I have, and I thank you very much for your time.